Whoever does not take up his cross and humble me cannot be my disciple. St. John of the Cross, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Amen. When we first look at today's saint, John of the Cross, it might seem to us that because he is in such a different league from us, St. Teresa of Avila, whom he aided so much in the reform of the Carmelites in the 16th century church, found him to be the purest soul in the church. And the church has declared him to be a doctor of the church, the doctor of mystical theology, the patron saint of poets, because of the beautiful spiritual poetry that he wrote, particularly his, the poem on the dark night of the soul. It might seem that he's entirely out of our league, and so he's the saint whom we, we honor and we, we venerate, but we would sort of leave it at that. But of course, no, as we, when we get to know a saint, we see all of the comforting common points, as it were, with him, his great devotion to our Blessed Mother at the age of five. Our Lady delivered him when he had fallen into a well and saved his life because he was to do great things. And later on in life, Our Lady, after a youth where he wasn't quite sure what Our Lord wanted him to do, directed him to join the Carmelite Order, the oldest order of Mount Carmel, uh, the oldest order dedicated to the Mother of God. And then we remember that by our brown scapular enrollment, we are all of us honorary Carmelites. So we take a greater interest in this thing. We have this in common with them. We wear the same habit. We are all of us children of Our Lady, the Queen, the beauty of karma. <coughs> then when we look at this saint, we consider what his great life's work was. On the one hand, it was to pray, and because he wanted his whole order to go back to the origins of being uh, contemplative and penitential and poor and prayerful, it was to oppose those who in turn opposed him in a word. His life was a life of faction and of division and of discord and of great grief. At some point, he was arrested by the members of his own order because of his desire to support uh, St. Teresa of Avila and his insistence upon the reform of the Carmelite order. They're symbolized, that reform was symbolized remember, by going barefoot or wearing sandals only and not shoes and stockings, which was a sign of poverty, and it was also a practical pen that they performed on, you can imagine, a day like this. So he was beaten, and he was thrown into a cell, and he was imprisoned by the Carmelites for nine months. He had to stand on a stool, remember, and uh, hold his book up to catch a little bit of light so that he could pray the divine office. But there, our Lord inspired him to write his beautiful poem on the dark night of the soul, the spiritual purification of the soul that any soul has to go through in its light towards God. And then he understood, he who was in prison, how he could be free. And he, he, he said famously, a little bird can be held captive either by a chain or by a thread. And he learned that way of interior spiritual detachment so he could have a true freedom. Nevertheless, when he got the chance, he did escape, he said later, simply because he missed being able to offer Mass. And then what must have been for him one of the greatest trials of all was that those who were on his side, and mind you, back then there were such bitter divisions, what would they do today? But it was nothing about the faith. It was all about how how one ought to live, and live the vow, the idea of the religious life, that everybody was Orthodox Catholic. And on the other side were those whom uh, St. Teresa of Avila generically referred to as the Lutherans. And everyone had a horror of the Lutherans. But they were all Catholics with such bitter divisions about these, what we would view truly as secondary issues. But then amongst his own, on his side of the Reformed Carmelites, there were some who wanted to break the order entirely and found their own order. And he was with those who said that no, those were their vows as Carmelites and they must keep them and they are, they're part of the Carmelite order. 
and these people caused him his grief and his suffering towards the last days of his life. He was found to be so very sick, his superiors told him he could choose any priory or monastery to go to, and he, and he chose a monastery where the superior, whom he had once had occasion to discipline, held a grudge against him, so that you might say that he suffered physical pain from illness and a very botched attempt at surgery, and a, a sort of a spiritual grief at these divisions. He was calumniated and falsely accused of many things and harshly treated. He suffered for almost his whole life long. He was one of those saints, a bit like the gentle little saint of uh, Lourdes, who said at the end of her life, I know that I'm going to die because I have nothing more to suffer. He was a great saint of the cross, well named of the cross, and a great saint of, uh, of suffering. When our Lord appeared to him, as he did to another doctor of the church, Thomas Aquinas, and he asked John of the Cross, what would you have as your reward? His answer was, Lord, to suffer and to be despised for thee. Now that's the kind of a prayer that if any of us were bold enough to make, we could be sure that it would be heard, and heard very quickly. Many times without praying that prayer, it is still heard, our Lord sends that to us for the good of our own soul. And so St. John is across time, in suffering and in contempt. And as soon as he died, like Benedict Joseph Labore, right away, everyone just realized, ah, we have a saint with us. And all of these clergy and all of these people came for his uh, funeral, and right away they began to take relics from his still a fresh corpse, because they realized that he truly was a saint, and a very great saint of God. He's the patron saint of poets, I think. He could probably be patron saint of roofers, because once when he and his brethren were traveling, they had to sleep outside during a snowstorm. When they awakened in the morning, God had made a whole roof of snow over them to protect them. And uh, our Lord very often, because he was so detached from earthly things, did little favors and gave him little graces, things that uh, would be necessary to cheer him up and cheer up the brethren. And he could certainly be a good saint for us in all of the splits and divisions and further divisions of what is left of the Catholic Church in our day. Not to lose our humility or our sense of humor or our spiritual perspective on things. That is to say, that if we love the cross, we would accept to be uh, despised and to have to follow the way of suffering for the love of our Lord. And most of all, of course, St. John of the Cross teaches us to pray. But unless we really pray, we can never understand our crosses. And we can never reach that point of great joy in the midst of even great suffering. St. John of the Cross Teach us to pray. God bless you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.